All right, welcome everybody. Um, today I have a uh, awesome guest. Today uh, we have the legend Tom Crutchfield here. Um, he is a big, big name. I know a lot of people know him. He's been in the business for a long time, uh, and I'm so honored and thankful that he gave us a chance to uh, sit down and talk about some awesome uh, information about these awesome animals. Um, so, Tom, uh, how long have you been in the business? Well, uh, well, first, I'd like to say thank you for the kind words. Uh, you were more than generous with them. I, I suppose if you mean, do you mean how long I've kept reptiles or been in the business of, of, of making money with reptiles in some way? All of it, I guess. Um, okay. Well, my love with reptiles, probably like a lot of you, started with dinosaurs, dinosaur books. And then one fateful day, I turned a rock over in my yard and I found a ring next to it in North Florida. And we already had seen alligators wild and, you know, at the little tourist attractions in Florida. And I was hooked from that day on, you know, and later on in high school, I earned the nickname Gator because I had the only guy that had alligators in his backyard. I literally did. Uh, uh, raised them up from babies to probably eight or nine feet long and then gave them to Ross Allen when I left home at 18. Gotcha. That's really cool. So I just never stopped. So it's been a very long time. I'm 73 years old now, so. All right. So <laughs> most of, pretty much all. I, I'm, not really I'm not really in the business much anymore. My daughter and my wife pretty much does everything. I'm pretty much retired. I'm really interested more now in reptile cognition than anything else because uh, I've learned so much about that <clears throat> in the last 15 years. And uh, I spent a lot of time watching and, and learning from the animals. <clears throat> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I've um, watching videos with you over on YouTube and stuff like that. I've um, really sparked my interest as well in, um, like you said, cognitive, the cognitive thinking in these animals. Um, it's so um intriguing and it's really awesome to be able to even though you're not speaking you're communicating with an animal um and i am like i love interacting with animals that way um so uh we talked about you like you said that you um caught a little red uh ring neck when you were mm -hmm. little and that kind of was what started it um well, yeah, and then by the time I suppose I was in my teens, uh, I began catching snakes to sell at roadside attractions like Snakeatorium and the Ross Allen back in that time period. Uh, and uh, I would a lot of times trade those for exotic reptiles too. I had my first reticular python, for instance, at 16 years old. And I put it in a cage with some cotton mouths I caught and immediately bit it and killed it. And, uh, of course, I was like, I had no idea, though, right? you know, what I was doing even back then. Certainly, I didn't need a reticulated python, but I thought I did. <laughs> right, right. I mean, yeah, you get what you are interested in, I guess. Um, yep. But, uh, yeah, we, uh, um, I, uh, I started um, when I was really young as well. I um, used to catch garter snakes because uh, I live in Kansas. Um, yeah. and that's a big thing. And, uh, I actually, as a kid, um, unintentionally, um, bred garter snakes without even trying. Um, we ca caught two of them, uh, put them in the same enclosure. And then one day they were as babies. Um, hey, but that's pretty good though. Cause I kept ring neck snakes at the beginning when I was six years old, I had to hide them from my parents yeah. and I kept them in jars because there was nobody kept up. Everybody hated reptiles. Yeah. Right. way different than now and uh, I tried to feed them cheese because I didn't know what they ate at all anyway you know so and then when they didn't look good anymore just after about a week I would turn them loose and then go find another one sort of thing gotcha. and then I kept salamanders too and but I kept those differently because I knew a little bit about them because I had seen a lot of them myself and where they live and stuff and I had some of those for years and years and years uh, one of them for about eight years I remember Gotcha. Uh, one of the, um, uh, I can't remember. Go ahead, though. Um, yeah, that's, I've always been kind of, uh, I guess, um, 
I don't feel comfortable working with like salamanders and amphibians and like especially like turtles. Like I want to, I just know um, it's a lot of work when it comes to water quality. Um, yeah, making yeah. sure uh, that the water quality is correct and everything like that. Um, and so the more information I've learned, the less I've, I, more I've kind of backed away from that type of animal until I know I'm, I have enough time to spend to make sure I'm taking care of them correctly. But see, that's responsible, you know, for her, her, her culture too. When you see something that you would like to have, that you realize at the time you're considering getting them, you really have no way to keep them. That would be a, a way that would be, you know, not toxic to them in some way over time, make them die quick rather than later. And so you just don't do it. Right. And that makes a lot more sense than a person that goes to a store and buys a baby water monitor when you should have an Aki. You know what I mean? And then the water monitor really, like the name implies, I mean, I've seen wild ones, hundreds and hundreds of them in Thailand, especially the Klongs and Lipkin Park, which is a city park in Thailand. There's thousands of giant water monitors. And when you go there and sit, everyone closest to you rushes, bum rushes the tape. If you bring food or anything, because so many people feed them. Yeah. And there's so many rivers. These things basically live an aquatic lifestyle. Right. And in captivity, you have to have a way to, to clean the water. And that's hard, you know? I mean, that's the first thing you're going to do when you clean the water is crap it immediately. So. Right. Uh, I say we have a, uh, a three and a half foot Nile monitor that we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he, uh, yeah, he, he loves being in the water. Um, yeah, we know why they call those in South Africa. Because they're sitting they're they're water lagoon. Yeah, water, lagoon, water lagoons in Afrikaans. They call them uh, water water guanas. Is what they call them, basically. Ah. Like water monitors, just a big lizard in the water. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, he was our first monitor, and um, we've been working with him, and it's been uh, a fun. Um, experience to re be able to try to hone uh, the reading and um, interacting with him uh, through uh, different small interactions um, because I know a lot of it is making sure that there's a positive uh, positive experiences each time you work, you work with them um, and uh, talking about that uh, so I know you you've kept a bunch of uh, venomous and specifically I want to talk about rattlesnakes um, okay. you have talked about before in one of either one of your videos or uh, something where you said that you can you've had a room full of rattlesnakes and you can walk in there and not one of them rattles that's correct and you can ask anyone that visited here you know when I had them but I felt bad because they still weren't in environmental conditions that I thought were too small but the point is, is that the, the animal, rattlesnakes, when they rattle, it is uh, basically it's a threat. They're scared. Okay, so our entire, really since I had I had the crocodile farm back in the, around 1990, is when I began to change how I thought about the kind of animals reptiles really are. Most people, humans anyway, we rate animals about how smart they are, with about how much they look and act like us. The reptiles don't have facial expression, for instance, like a primate might. So, so we might think that, well, I got alligators, and we did say that for years, has a pea sized brain, is, you know, dumb as a box of rocks, literally, and uh, has no sense. Yet, yet uh, I've watched a video of an American crocodile in Tavernier Key surface in a canal to take a half floating bag of garbage and push it up to a boat ramp, push it half in and half out of the water. And they go back in and sink down in about three feet of water. It's set an ambush and it put bait or a raccoon or a cat. So you have animals, and I saw with my animals too. And you see these videos all over the world of people in with these giant crocodilians and that they've raised and that they don't try to hurt them at all. They don't really, they're, they're as intelligent really as, as a lot of primates. I'm not sure because it's hard to measure their intelligence because it's hard to get them to perform any reptile to perform. But all of them are sentient beings, make no mistake, all of them. And monitors are one of the more intelligent of all the squamate reptiles anyway, in my opinion. 
Yeah, I definitely have seen it. Like, uh, just through this last year, I've seen I've done so much research and watching other people. We're inter we're interacting with them and learning from them. Like Kevin from Nerd and um, uh, Brian Barcheck and you yeah. and uh, Ken and Harkin, all of them. Just watching them interact with these different monitors and uh, learning about like really seeing what they're talking about, seeing the um, them thinking, seeing them actually reading the room and seeing all that stuff um, really, like I said, just inspired me of like, that's what I I really find interesting in working with animals. Um, I know I've always wanted to work with animals. I just didn't know specifically what I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> well, I would encourage you to, to, to look more into reptile cognition as you progress and as your career progresses because I, I won't live to see it, but uh, one of the scientists has been an early scientist on all of this, and he's looked at it all of his life, and it like, helped me a lot in understanding what I've been seeing. Uh, Gordon Burkhart, Dr. Burkhart, he reviewed some of his works and others, and uh, and, and just we're just it's just right on the breakthrough of us really understanding because before we didn't, the biggest holdback on all that was understanding how to test the animals. You know what I mean? For instance, if you took someone from two different countries and gave them an IQ test, one might pass and one might fail unless it was something that was standardized, like with the country's cultural standards, sort of. It's the same with the animals. How do you, you know, first of all, they have to lose their fear of you. And that's the thing I say, before, this is one thing that has to happen before you can study any of those things, is it's only when both the keeper and the kept lose their fear of each other that the real magical understanding of it will begin. And I know I got off on a tangent, but I wanted to get that in there because it actually is a really important thing because you can't even understand cognition if the reptile or you is afraid of each other in any way because you're not, it's not going to let you see any of its secret life because it, it, it doesn't know what you'll do. For sure. I definitely under, I definitely agree with that. Like, um, I have seen that with all of our animals um, that yeah. we have. Like, uh, I have a, um, a Burmese python that we rescued, um, that he was um, underfed, he was um, not handled at all, he had no interactions, and all the interactions that he had was very negative, um, because he was food motivated, and he was very hungry, and every time they would try to hold him, he thought he was getting food, and so he'd be striking at them, and then bad stuff happened during that. So he was just very food aggressive, and once I've gotten him to eat, more now now he's on a good like he's eating good he's got he's not hungry all the time uh he's not as aggressive we're still having to work through some of those those behaviors um getting him well don't reward yeah don't reward the bad behavior though remember that i trained uh, that big reticuli head out here before i i let greg raziani have it uh, she was about six meters long we called her bertha and she weighed 180 pounds without food inside of her and at least 20 or 21 feet long. And I trained, she became so dangerous to go in to introduce food because she could strike 12 or 15 feet. And if she caught you, you're going to die. I mean, right. there's a walk-in outdoor cage. So I went in with PVC pipe, and when she would come out real aggressively to eat, and I'd be carrying the chickens, I'd tap her nose. First time I did it, I had to tap her nose twice. After that, never again. She would come out, and she broke, but instead of being kinked up, she would have her neck straight out which indicates it's not going to grab me when it does that. And I just handle the rabbits, no problem. So snakes are highly intelligent too, is the point that you have to train them, but don't reward bad behavior. So when you Burmese, if it gets to like flying out of the cage, where they get people call that cage aggression, it's not cage aggression. You're training them because the faster they come out, the faster you throw that food. Right. When she comes right out, don't feed her. Stand right there, tap her on the nose, close the door and open the door again. And then when she stopped, hand it to her. That's what we do on all the monitors and everything. And it just lets them know what your boundaries are. And yes, they are intelligent enough to learn. They learn. They learn quick. Gotcha. And they don't forget. And I, and I say that with experience from lots of kinds of reptiles. Gotcha. Yeah. That, I, I appreciate hey, that. Uh, bring me, hang on a minute. Vanessa. Vanessa. Okay. Uh, would you bring me dirt? Just grab him, uh, Elijah, for me, please. Because I'm going to do a thing. Okay. 
All right, never mind. Go ahead. We'll keep talking. I was just going to say, uh, uh, thank you for like giving me that information. Um, I appreciate it because um, that's I want to try to uh, learn as much as I can because um, I there's not here in Kansas we don't have very much about uh, very many places here um, to educate the public on any kind of animals or anything like that. We have some zoos, uh, but they're AZAs, so they're very behind wires, and that's just where they stay. You don't really learn much. Um, I know, and the AZA has to be so careful, too. Even their staff are not allowed to step outside of the box, let's say, like I am. This right. is my farm. These are my animals. It's my life. Uh, um, if I want to... I can do things that zoos or not would never be permitted to do, you know, people that work at zoos. But, but anyway, in a second, I'm going to bring something in here to show you that you'll probably find a little bit hard to believe too. <coughs> uh, Elijah just went to get it. I uh, want to talk about lizards that are, <coughs> sorry, that are conditioned to people once they lose their fear of you. I mean, we literally have lizards here that would not run away. Almost all of them, none of them here would as far as that goes. But when we were robbed, the people that robbed the place, just like Kenna, they broke the locks in a lot of our cages and left the door wide open. On, and they only took the real tame crocodile monitor of Jimmy. The other crocodile monitor to pertain to us, but the strangers, not so much sometimes, especially if it's rough handling. And they didn't even try to take them, but they didn't want you to know what was stolen. Right. And when we discovered the, the theft, only one animal had gotten out, and that was a rhino iguana. And it was sitting in front of its cage about three feet. And it just walked back in its cage where it walked up because it was hoping we were going to feed it. And the big monitors didn't even get out of the cage or even try. So we didn't get to have anything out of it at all, except what they took. How crazy is that? Yeah, that's insane. It's um, insane. But that's, I, I knew you had a, um, either a rhino or a rock iguana that you have like walking around your place. I have, I have actually five of them. Okay. Nice. Yeah. yeah but Rocco is sort of the famous one. I, I can't, you're not moving around now. Like now you're back home, sort of. You weren't before I, you were there, but it was even frozen in place or something. Yeah. We but, both uh, kind of not have great connections. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, but I, we've got, I don't know, a dozen big rocky guanas here that are all really tame. Uh, Roscoe is one of the friendliest ones, you know, and well, they're all friendly like that, actually, but he's just sort of a, a favorite of mine, like a favorite kid or something, and and he and Rita live by our house. So, well, here, let me introduce you to this guy first. This is uh, Derp, and Derp is a hybrid black and green tree monitor okay. that was produced in captivity sort of by accident, I think, in okay. Indonesia, it was imported. And I got it, and I'll give a high five to my friend. The, uh, the uh, he, he buys and sells reptiles too, Joshua Barber in uh, Florida, up around Port St. Lucie. And uh, he knew this shouldn't be bred or anything. And so, because it's like sort of people friendly, like it is, very people friendly actually, uh, he, uh, he just took it down and, and traded it to us. And we just keep her because she's intelligent. We're not gonna, not gonna breed her at all. We just, we just want to show. And I've learned so much about tree monitors. One thing I learned about this tail, and this would be a paper for someone if anybody wanted to do it. When the tree monitor is not afraid of you, the tail, when it hits you, kind of sticks to you and it feels almost like a gecko's pad. And I believe that the scale somehow creates sort of a little mini vacuum. See how it does when I do that? Mm -hmm. And the tail is the most important thing of balance in everything they have. They use it in everything they do. But we never see that unless we see them like this. You know, or in the wild, and as you can imagine, these in the wild are just about impossible to observe anyway. But if you notice, she's not trying to run away. Right. She's just trying to look out what's going on. Right. She's not even very flinchy. You moved your hand. No, no. Oh, no, no. You just pick her up and stuff. She doesn't care at all. She's just, this is what happens when the reptile is not afraid of you. Right. Now we do that. We, we have about an eight foot crocodile monitor that will do the same thing. Get right up on top of you. And I have a lot of videos and stuff of uh, my wife, Stacy, and myself with, with Bill with his hips about that big, you know, on our shoulders and stuff. See, most people aren't going to take that risk right. because they're still a little bit afraid of it. And because you are, you don't understand 
when the animal invites you in the world. And I'm not suggesting anybody do what we do. In fact, I'm telling you, you should not do it at all because very few have that kind of level of understanding of mythology. And I'm not bragging or anything like that. I'm just, I'm, what I'm telling you is the truth. Just watch two people handle snakes. And the same snake, same cobra will try to kill one guy and the next guy won't even try to bite. Right. Depending on how it's handled. Right, right. And it's the same with all of these. I see how he's came back or, or she, and she's going to sit right there now until she's perfectly happy, you know, and she, yeah. she, she liked Kenan too. She went to Kenan Harkin when he filmed this. He had her, uh, the children, walk around the yard and he bit him on the earlobe. But it, it really did, but he really liked it too. He tried climbing on his head and like that. But she's quite, quite a, a good representative for a tree monitor. And I would encourage people to breed these in perfect culture. Instead of picking all these bigger monitors that are more common to satisfy egos, because all of the tree monitors live on these little small islands off uh, New Guinea, mainly off Papua New Guinea or well, West Iriani. And uh, some of them, like the blue tree monitor, lives only on the island of Patanta. Patanta is 100 square miles. That's 20% the size of Lake Okeechobee here in Florida. They live nowhere else in the world. One volcano explosion and they're gone forever. And, and, and they're not either side east too. And if the purpose of culture, kept stuff like that even the green tree monitor which is one of the more common this found uh, just on new guinea but 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 some of the others like the yellow tree monitor tries in jerry and there's one that's found even i can't remember it it's a sort of an obscure one that's found on a a, a smaller island even at the top time. so herpetoculture could help the conservation of these beautiful monitor lizards and almost anyone could keep these because they don't get so big Right. And once they're not afraid of you, they don't act like the ones do that people buy him for you. Right. This is what they act like. <laughs> they're curious. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, if you go anywhere and want it, right? Right. What's it doing? Just. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love it. We have um, a uh, reticulated python that we. Uh, Very curious. About 10 foot right now. She's a little, almost two years old. Um, um, and she is like the most in, like curious snake that I have had my entire life. I've never interacted. They're highly with intelligent. Don't let me, I, don't even get me started on people to keep those big giant snakes in the little boxes because if, you, if you, they knew what I knew about giant snakes and especially reticulate pythons, you're talking about an animal in nature that lives 40 or 50 years. Right. And that is highly intelligent. And it learns very quick about if somebody takes care of them, knows that they, they recognize people, all reptiles do, uh, but in particular, reticulated pythons. And I just, they have a bad sort of, uh, sometimes a bad care in the US because, you know, we just, they really need, when they're big adults, for damn near a room size cage, you know, for a real big one. Right. What are you doing now? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and you help, don't you hold him up so you can so sure. you and everybody else can see him good or her good. Okay. Flip it up a little bit. In the sun, it actually glistens. Turn it. Would you turn that light off? My home right there. The one over there. I think. A little bit better. If you lift her up a little bit. There you go. Wow. This, that's Adam, how she works. And outside, we have two blue tree monitors, the two that we kept of red last year. Uh -huh. They act like this, too. Oh, that's awesome. Yep. Okay. Let me give her back to you. Actually, she belongs to uh, my grandson, Elijah, so he's going to take her back to her house outside. Gotcha. Um, but, yeah, and she is, like, when we go to birthday parties and stuff, she, everybody loves our reticulated python. She, um, because I'm, she's such a great um, educational, like, show of the way that they use their tongues um, and to sh uh, for, like to show the behaviors with the conflicts, um, and so because she she just 
she's always flicking her tongue, but it's never short. It's always long and it's moving around and she's always moving. And so it just, it allows, uh, she's a great ambassador to be able to get people to get comfortable with those big snakes. And they're, well, they're wonderful snakes. And if the, if the, you know, I have no objections to keeping giant snakes. I've kept giant snakes since I was really young. I said that bad attempt at 16, but by the time I was, uh, 24 years old and married in our first our first house we had at 25 i just remodeled my garage and sort of oh that's beautiful look at that yeah this wow is, this is our mail that we just got um yeah that's a, it almost looks like a silhouette a little bit but, you know from locale the retic i mean uh he i think is um i think mainland but i think his uh mom and dad were uh mom was 18 foot and uh dad was like 13. that's my favorite kind of retics or those like that with the yellow head you know and the body more than any more than any morph of any kind right I, that's, honestly, wonderful. that's wonderful yeah and it's are... happy too. see i have it's happy to be out it doesn't want to get away either it just wants to right you know just you know look at but if you think about it, it must enrich them too. When you enter, see how it's going away from you and then comes back up on you, and that it's just exploring. Yeah, yeah, I, very, very cool. Uh, and my favorite thing is both of our retics. They both, what, 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 oh. <laughs> they both love to um, get their like underneath their uh, like their chins rubbed. The chin. That actually, just to let you know, a, a lot of retics like that that I've had too. They like to be scratched under their chin. Yeah, it's interesting. But it is. You know what else really likes that too is the big crocodile monitor with Stacy. Oh yeah. He starts rubbing him on the chin. He'll put his head up like a cat, you know. Yeah. And he's doing this big giant dinosaur thing, dude, with a head that big, and he's got up there could bite our arm off, and he's like, like trying to stretch his head out of shape to get scratched on the neck. That's crazy. Funny. Um, but when you have this, these kind of interactions with animals, though, and, and get to understanding the levels where you're starting to look at the animals themselves and really care about how the animals feel about their life, and that level, that, that's what we're getting at now in herbal culture, I think. And it, it, uh, I, I didn't think like I think now 30 years ago. As I have learned, I have evolved, and as I have evolved, I've learned, and a master always remains the pupil. You must remember that. So as I learned more and more, then I had to change a lot of what I was doing because I morally couldn't do it anymore. Because I had rated reptiles the same as we all rate animals, you know, sort of like mammals or the, after mammals come birds and, right. and reptiles and then amphibians and then fish. And, and by the time we get down to reptiles, we don't think any more about giving like live goldfish and iguanas away as prizes at fairs. Right. Think about that. Right. But if we can change how people perceive the kind of an animal reptiles are, right, and rate them better, then we have a better chance of ensuring that we have reptiles right. forever. That's because the more like us they are, the more sort of I don't know how to put it. The more we rate them, I don't know. The better we better be treat them. Right, right. <laughs> we have more respect for them. Um, that means the better we'll take care yeah. of them. Yeah. Um, that's like our biggest uh, like um, goal overall for Atlas. Uh, our business is that um, we want to change the uh, the idea of reptiles. Uh, and less is more. You don't have to have. The more, it's a lot more impressive to keep five animals in really a cool habitat where they they can be the, the animals they really are. I didn't mean to break up, but I I I'm passionate, I guess. So I don't, so it, it, to let them be the animals they are, keeping five like that, and keeping twenty five that are in bare minimal stuff, what I call life support systems, enough to live right. and breathe. But that if we locked us, ourselves in a bathroom, we'd still live and breathe, just not as long. Right. You know, we would be have a miserable life, and uh, kind of like retics. You know, you hardly ever find a captive we take over 20 years old. Right. You just don't. Right. And uh, that's like, yeah, we want to, because um, we want to open up a building here in Kansas Good. where people can interact with, kind of like um, uh, what Brian has. Um, 
and we want to offer big, big enclosures, offer the animals the best possible enclosures that we can. Um, so then people can see them in uh, environment like they would be, um, but then also get a physical interaction with the animal. And that you can't beat that because that that beats any AZA zoo or anything, particularly when you get the physical interaction part of it. You know, right. and it's become so bad in the U.S. that it's so limited. Now we're just sort of uh, eliminating most of the people from the real natural world, sadly. And so they need to be able to interact with these animals. Right. It's important for, for everything. So, well, I'm, I'm glad. I encourage you to continue, you know, so. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to pause the recording real quick because uh, for some reason Zoom's about to, like, kick the recording. Um, okay. And then we'll try to see if we can restart it. All right. Um, so... How do you feel about the new laws that are um, trying to be pushed, uh, especially in Florida? Well, it's been coming for a long, long time, and it's nothing really new. It's just worse now than it's ever been before with more pressure and with the it is certainly behind the scenes of a lot of animal rights groups involved in it. Uh, it's a double-sided coin, though. We have given them enough ammunition so that they can do that, even though all of the things that they that are bad really compared to everything else that's bad it's not even a big deal but it is to them because for whatever reason you know they're passionate about what they do just like we are about what we do right. uh, and it all remember all like everything else in the world it depends on your perspective of something whether it's good or bad you know i mean i mean i i i i, I understand what they are and how idiotic they are but they probably think we're the same, you know? So it's like, what the hell do you do? They're a lot better organized than we are. So when they've got into power in high places, which we have never done, and we've never been able to secure, we need lobbyists to, we really need full-time lobbyists. That's what we actually need. Right. Uh, in every state, I hate to say it, because lobbyists basically talk to the representatives and senators and bribe them. And that's how they become wealthy in their first term in office. To, uh, uh, they can go from a network of two hundred thousand dollars to to five million dollars in one term. Anything, any any sort of a state election you can see anywhere. I mean, that's just it's all business. That's how it's run. It's about money. Right. It's always about money, sadly. And uh, really, with the private people, with reptiles, it's a passion with us. We do, well, I think, sometimes take it to to the point it becomes a passion, but an obsession to, like we were talking about earlier, trying to keep things that we really don't have the ability to keep. But by the same token, we, we love the animals more than we love a lot of other things. And I'm not sure it's the same with these PETA people. I'm not really sure what their you know goal is exactly, or it's, it's not usage of any kind of animals anywhere, but that's impossible too, because something must die for something else to live. Right. Always. Every time you take a breath, you're killing, I don't even know how many microorganisms, you know? Right. So I don't even know. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it says, it's just, it's a, it's a terrible thing, but I'm going to tell you this, we have to fight against it, tooth and nail, and we, we really need lobbyists. Now, right. Florida had made up their minds before they ever went into that meeting. Right. The week on those regulations. And it's yeah. definitely designed to try to put people out of business. However, because of the way it's written, everyone, if they got a ticket, they just need to stand up to them and just take it to court. That's what I did. I got uh, all the tickets I've ever had for this game because I've never really broken any laws. was in the 90s with this one guy. It was a personal thing. He didn't like me. And uh, I wound up, but... He, he wrote tickets. I went to court three times on it. Last time, the judge said I was a victim of selective and arbitrary enforcement of the law. I didn't want a jury trial. They're misdemeanors. I want the judge to hear it. Gotcha. And if it's unconstitutional, you know, it's just it's unconstitutional. And right. some of the stuff they're, they're doing is. So let's just see what happens. We can't do any more than we're doing right now, I don't think. And I think U.S. ARC has done as good a job as anybody can. But I think it needs to expand the arms and actually get in each state a lobbyist of sorts uh, in the capital and actually 
dealing with the senators because, and the representatives because I don't know any other way to to get our voice heard. They're right. certainly not going to be by open meetings anywhere. Right. Yeah, I didn't say that's a it's a it's a big thing um, here. Like on our podcast, we like to make sure we uh, we talk about um, all the different things and we try to promote U.S. art as much as possible. Um, yes. And that's a big thing for us because um, like a lot of people say that they are the ones that are fighting for our rights to keep and um, actually learn about these these reptiles and these and be able to uh, teach the public about reptiles. Um, so we, um, for sure go check out us art, um, please. And if you can donate, uh, become a member, it's super cheap and it's, uh, really easy to their, um, website, uh, is super easy to navigate. Uh, and so please go check them out. Um, but man, I want to say also, please, please support us art. What he's what he said and more. Please. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, is there out of all the, all the reptiles or animals in general that you have worked with, is there one that you specifically, um, just really enjoy working? With? Uh, Cyclora, you know, any kind of rocky guanas, because I've been, I've been lucky enough in my life to have seen about five or six species in nature. And I did research on uh, Cyclora Riley I Riley I uh, ten years ago, and been keeping and breeding them since the nineteen seventies. And I was actually one of the guys that brought in the early um, shipments of rhinoceros iguanas from Haiti in the nineteen seventies. It's completely legal to do it then, and uh, and we caught them. Wow! And they are not like the animals today, uh, but uh, they. The, 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 an iguana, a rhino iguana, or any rock iguana, really is probably the best pet reptile that anyone could ever get, providing they have the space. They're highly intelligent. Uh, hours you can come in the house, like if you were a dog. I mean, they know they knock on the door to come in, but scratching or, or bumping it so the door makes a noise. And they have, uh, it's, it's, you wouldn't understand it unless you like experienced it, but they really are. A lot of people in Florida have them like that too. Uh, and and uh, they're, uh, by far, that would be the one that I would be the most interested in, yes. Because gotcha. it was a, one of the, I, I call wild ones, you know, I have the experiences in Haiti. I made about 12 trips there. Um, that's awesome. Uh, that's, I've, uh, yeah, I've always, um, I really enjoy, um, I really enjoy the monitors. Um, they've definitely caught uh, my attention. I've wanted to work with uh, a cyclora um i'm just kind of again don't have the room for them uh, and I, like i like you said i want to make sure they have the correct space for them so yeah. um oh, the croc monitors of the monitor lizards that i work with i love tree monitors that are per perfect for horticulture but for someone like me with a space outside and everything right. crocodile monitors have to be my favorite varanid of all time gotcha and uh, I would rather keep them than I would Komodo dragons, certainly. I've never kept a Komodo, but I had a lot of friends that had them in zoos, and I've had a lot of experience with them. And, and while I love Komodos, not as much as I do Croc monitors. Right. That's cool. Uh, I, don't, yeah. I understand the ecology so much better on Croc monitors, you know, spending all the years uh, gotcha. studying. Um, yeah, I've um, – a lot of people I know really like the Komodo dragons, Um and it's been like, it's like a huge, it's like what, when you say like, uh, this animal is like in the same genus as uh, a, the Komodo dragon, everybody's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they know that animal. Um, but for me, I have like grown, grown super, super fond of parentes. I, a parenti? Oh yeah, a parenti. I had a lot of, some experience with those in Australia too, so. Yeah, I got uh, a whole bunch of them and see them and uh, mess with them and that. And I didn't like them to be honest with you as much as I like some of the other monitors there. Right. I I would love just to at least interact with them. I love their pattern and yeah, they're pretty. Yeah, they're very pretty. Um, and so it was just it's just something that I've always I've I've want to do. 
um, just even have a chance, even if it's not me keeping them, because I don't see ever being able to, especially with all the laws and everything like that. Um, but well, there, there, there's never been really any number of parentheses in the United States. I think Ty Park has three or four of them in that. Uh, P. Zuzu had them. Uh, a lot of people in Australia breed them, though. Uh, yeah. They're in the corporate culture in Australia. Gotcha. That's really cool. Um, so uh, I uh, will go ahead and uh, wrap this up. Um, again, thank you so much, Tom for uh, giving us the chance to talk. Um, I honestly did not expect to ever get a chance to be able to talk to a lot of people who do this um, that are more commonly known because uh, I'm just starting. We started uh, Atlas Education in uh, 2020. Um, so we're still pretty new, um, but we uh, are just trying to work through and trying to network out and Trying to get as much to be a part of it um, as much as everybody else is. So um, again, well, I thank you. yeah, and well, thank you so much for inviting me here. And you got to start somewhere, and uh, I think you did a pretty good job. And good luck to 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 you both, and keep on keeping up. Thank you. I, um, whenever we make a trip down to Florida, I'll definitely try to get a yeah, hold of this, and we'll show you around. Yeah, definitely. You'll definitely be surprised. Oh, I bet. <laughs> I would okay. love to learn even more. All right. Thanks, man. Take care. All right. Bye.